So hi everyone and welcome to our video, uh, the start of our lecture, our formal discussion on uh, financial decision making under certainty, at least the more uh, mathematical and the nitty gritty part of it. And this will deal by, uh, mainly with how the financial markets start to integrate. So for the most part, what we've been discussing is just maybe a, a short extension of micro, which is replacing uh, the goods with consumption streams. But now we're going to start to um, add a bit of financial concepts to this uh, sort of model that we're building, which is the Fisher model. And in doing so, we're going to try to understand the intricacies in all of them. And as we've said, in, in modeling preferences, we use an indifference curve like normal and the utility function. And what we have instead of goods uh, in financial economics uh, is this concept of a consumption stream. Now, the consumption stream, actually, there are many possible consumption streams. There are many combinations or permutations you could do. In, in similar to how you think of consumption of goods in typical micro, there are many ways that uh, there are many different combinations of good one, good two, or good n that you could opt to do. So you could opt to consume a high amount of good one, a low amount of good two, and so on. So there are many consumption uh, opportunities that you could have. And essentially, the same goes uh, with consumption streams in that uh, you have this concept called a consumption opportunity set. And your consumption opportunity set is essentially the feasible lifetime consumption streams for a consumer. So what do we mean by this? Well, we know that the endowments that people receive are a claim to goods and services in the present and in the future. So that's your, um, you're given with a, a why not and a why one. Your why not is, um, uh, is the amount that, uh, say, your income or uh, an allowance that you're given with in the present, while Y1 is an amount or an income that you receive in the future. So remember, the Fisher model is just a two-period model, the present and the future. And in the present, you're endowed with an income, and that's Y0. And in the future, you're endowed with some income as well, and that's Y1. And as I said here, it might represent income, it might represent some allowance, maybe interest income, pension income, or gifts or gifts or allowances, whatever. So those are things that could constitute why not and why one. And as we said, a consumer can always choose a consumption stream equal to his or her endowment. But there may be other opportunities as well. So for example, if you, if you get endowed with some income, say you earn income in period one, well, you could opt to spend the entire income in period one or, or in the current period, or you could opt to maybe lend part of that income, say you don't spend it all, you can lend. Or if you think it's not enough, you can borrow. Because remember, the financial markets exist such that you can smooth out your consumption. So you can borrow and you can lend in an attempt for, as we'll see, to be able to maximize lifetime utility. And that's the goal and it's the reason why we're going to start to integrate the financial markets into this. So this is a graph showing a simple uh, consumer endowment. And a consumer endowment uh, is, um, lies inside of a graph that's uh, where in the y-axis is future consumption, that's C1, and the x-axis is C0. And um, at that endowment point, say those were the values that you think C1 and C0 would be, essentially, you consume everything that uh, what was endowed to you in each period. So you don't, you neither borrow nor lend. We'll get more into that as we move on. So the role of the capital markets, in this case, the financial markets, are key and are critical here because the capital market exchange allows uh, the borrowing and the lending part, okay? So this capital market exchange contains the borrowing, lending, and the intertemporal budget constraint. And this is something that we haven't discussed in micro before. Because in traditional micro, you have no avenue to lend or save. So there's no incentive for you to save at all, right? You just consume everything because you just live for one period. But we know that human beings don't behave that way. You don't die the next period. You try and uh, you, you, of course, there's a higher chance of you living the next period, so you might as well try and smoothen out your consumption. As we keep on saying, the goal of financial economics is to smooth out consumption. 
And one way we do that is to be able to participate in the exchange or in the capital market exchange. So the consumer can borrow or lend consumption claims between periods. And the thing is, it's a uh, consumer's decision to borrow or lend must be consistent with the endowment. We, what do we mean by this? Well, we cannot borrow more than what we can repay. So when a consumer makes a realistic decision, he or she must make a decision in such a way that, okay, if my needs in the present, uh, if my endowment in the present is not sufficient, I can opt to borrow, right? But I cannot borrow too much in such a manner that I cannot repay what I'm gonna borrow. So the person thinks rationally and, okay, I should only borrow up to this amount, right? Now, this, uh, uh, there's a big question that occurs now is, what consumption streams are possible with borrowing and lending? Now, remember, without borrowing and lending, essentially, we're at that point. Whatever we're endowed with, the optimal thing is to just consume everything that we have given or endowed at each period. But now that we have the capital markets there, we now can ask the question, well, what consumption streams are possible with borrowing and with lending? Right? So what are the new frontiers that we can reach given that we can now borrow and lend? And what we'll see is the way that we're going to sort of illustrate the budget line, in this case, it's now going to be an intertemporal budget line because it varies per period. It goes through periods rather, is uh, it depends on the opportunities to borrow and actually to lend. So the form of a consumer's budget constraint depends on his opportunities to borrow and lend. So we're going to break it down into three sort of cases, right? So into three sort of uh, thoughts. And I hope as we progress, you can see how the theory becomes more and more realistic and how it evolves. So for the first case, let's say that we're going to allow for the existence of capital markets. And in this case, a consumer can opt to borrow and can opt to lend, right? But the uh, as we know, it, it, since we're dealing with a financial uh, with something in the financial market it has an interest rate for the simplest case let's assume that a consumer can borrow and can lend at approximately the same uh, not just approximately but at the same rate so the borrowing and the lending rate are the same so assume that the individual can borrow at the same rate that it can lend so that means that the borrowing rate which we will denote as rb and the lending rate which we will denote as rs they're equal in this case A, and that's just equal to some parameter R. And of course, obviously you will criticize this on the outset, but again, there are some banking systems actually still existing in the world that operate on this behavior, that they would have a borrowing equal to a lending rate. So uh, beats me why that's the reason, but then this is, a, this is something actually not too far off from reality, even though we think of it as, you know, quite not uh, realistic for our case. Now, if a person, okay, if a consumer does not consume the entire amount of the endowment, remember the endowment in the first period is why not, he or she can lend an amount we call S0, right? And S0 is essentially the difference between what the consumer was endowed with, which is why not, and what the consumer spent in the present period, which is C0. The difference between those two is essentially a saving, right? That's why we denote it as S. And essentially, if the consumer opts to participate in the financial markets, he or she can just uh, lend the entirety of the savings, right? There's no uh, option for precautionary saving. Let's say we take that out for simplicity of uh, analysis. That person can effectively loan out or lend out the entire savings part, which is S0. And the loan will be repaid with some interest rate R, right? It can be repaid with some interest rate R. And under this, okay, so remember, at the present, the consumer didn't uh, consume everything, so didn't spend the entirety of why not. So he or she will loan out S0, which is the savings from not spending everything at the present period. Therefore, his or her future consumption will be C1, will be equal to what he or she were endowed with in the next period, which is in the future period, plus essentially the interest income born out of the lending activity because the consumer opted to lend everything that he or she saved. 
right? So remember, there is no uh, decision made after the second period because the consumer effectively dies the second period because there's no other period after than the future, right? So there is no incentive for the consumer to save a second time, right? So he or she will obviously consume everything in the next period. And that consumption will be equal to the endowment in the future plus the interest income from uh, the present because of loaning out in the present. And if we rewrite this, we're going to come up with this form that it's going to be equal to, so we're just going to distribute the one plus R to both, uh, to both uh, factors here. And we get one plus R times Y naught plus Y1 minus one plus R times C naught. And we'll see this um, occur on and on, right? So you'll see this again in the next slide. So another thing that the consumer could do instead of uh, lend is, of course, to borrow. So say the consumer wants to consume more depending on his preferences in the present. So the consumer, uh, to consume more than the present endowment, the consumer must borrow the amount. So in this case, C0 is greater than Y0. Therefore, there's no savings, right? There's no saving because you consume more than you earn. Right? You would need to, or, the, or than you were endowed with, you would need to now borrow money. You need to borrow money such that you can satisfy your preferences. And in the next period, because you loaned out money for the present, you would need to repay that, uh, that amount in the future, right? You would need to repay it come the second period, right? With an interest rate R. Now remember, it's the same interest rate because we assume, because this is case A, that the borrowing and that the lending rate are exactly the same, which is equal to R. So under this, future consumption will be what you were endowed with in the future less the interest payable from your loan in the present. Remember, you have to pay out your loan that you took, that you borrowed in the present, so you would need to repay that in the future. So this is your um, future, uh, your future endowment, less the interest, um, the interest that you would have to pay out, right? So that's one plus R times C naught minus Y naught. And again, if we rewrite this, we're gonna come up with exactly the same form here. Now it's gonna be the same because again, the borrowing, the lending rate are the same. But it, this will, this will not be our case as we go through the other cases. So note, it's the approximately the same. Uh, style in the same case. Now, let's sort of generalize this. Therefore, the consumer's intertemporal budget constraint, whenever the interest rate for borrowing and uh, saving is the same or lending is the same, uh, is basically the form that we derived here, which is that C1 is equal to 1 plus R times Y0 plus Y1 minus 1 plus R times C0. For all zero, Okay, for, uh, for your present consumption being greater than or equal to zero, but it should be less than, so we're gonna, know, we're gonna sort of derive this later, but I can tell you now that this is what you call the future value of a consumer's endowment. It's the future wealth of a consumer. And all that this uh, restriction of the domain is saying is that a consumer can only spend, okay, it, it can only consume in the present uh, a quantity that is less than or equal to their future wealth. Okay, so uh, they cannot spend more than they can, uh, they cannot, uh, you know, consume more than their capability to borrow, right? So they cannot just spend on and on and borrow ridiculously. So it, it has to come up to this to that in, it can repay all that it borrowed, right? So that's the rationale for that. And what you'll notice is this budget constraint here, we can rewrite it as one plus R times C naught, right? If you transpose this to the other side, plus C one equal to one plus R Y naught plus Y one. And essentially, this just means that the future value of a uh, lifetime consumption, you know, that's this one here. So this one is your future value of lifetime consumption should be equal to the future value of your endowment, right? So this is the future value of your endowment. This is the future value of your lifetime consumption, right? And uh, that's a very intuitive condition, right? And it, it's actually very much in finance and uh, of course, direct application of economics that uh, the, the value that you would have in consumption in the future is essentially the future value of your endowment because you cannot, you know, you cannot uh, spend more 
than you were uh, uh, endowed with uh, given and adjusting for their present and their future values, right? So uh, that's that. And then uh, note that uh, W1, okay, so we're gonna make this, uh, we're gonna set this one as W1 and you'll notice that it's gonna actually be an intercept later on. And this is equal to the future value of the consumer's endowment, right? So this is the future wealth of consumer. And we'll understand what W1 means effectively when we start to graph these things, right? So alternatively, we can write it this way too. So if you recall, we wrote it this way, we can divide both of the sides by one plus R. So if we divide both of these sides by one plus R, we can get C naught is equal to C1 over one plus R equal to Y naught plus Y1 over one plus R. And essentially this implies that the present value of lifetime consumption is equal to the present value of endowment. Right? And this correlates directly with our assumption earlier that the future value of lifetime consumption should equal the future value of endowment. It goes the same with the present. And again, we're going to denote something here, which is W naught is equal to Y naught plus Y1 discounted by the interest rate is the present value of the consumer's endowment, i.e. effectively the consumer's current wealth, right? Current wealth. Now, if we draw the line, okay, uh, if we essentially illustrate this intertemporal budget constraint or what we formally call as the capital market trading line, uh, we have this graph here. So notice we have here this line, which represents this equation that C1 is equal to 1 plus R times Y0 plus Y1 minus 1 plus R times C0. Our endowment point is here. So if, let's say, the consumer opts to consume here, he or she will not borrow or lend, right? Uh, that person will just consume everything that he or she is endowed with in each period. Now, in this part, okay, if in this part of the budget constraint, okay, so, or the intertemporal budget constraint, if you'll notice, okay, the consumption, okay, the consumption in the present, so say you were here, right? C naught is somewhere here, the true C naught is somewhere here, or somewhere here. And you notice that C naught is less than Y naught. So this is less than Y naught. It means that at this part, okay, on essentially on this proportion of the budget constraint, okay, is your lending pro your lending proportion. So anything here, right, since C naught is less than the initial endowment, if, uh, it just means that you have something, uh, the consumer has some savings, right? It means that the consumer can opt to lend out the amount and he or she would earn interest income in the next period. So that's what it means. But conversely, if the uh, consumer had, uh, say, a C naught equal to this amount, okay, so C, let's say C naught was here. So say C naught was here. C naught in this case is now greater than Y naught. So C naught is greater than Y naught. Uh, it just means that in order for the consumer to be able to, you know, um, get this additional money, right? Because this is in units of currency. In order for the consumer to get these additional units of currency to be able to spend C naught, this green C naught amount in the present, he or she would need to borrow and uh, pay back the interest in the second period. And essentially, this means that this proportion of the budget constraint is the borrowing proportion of the budget constraint. So the red part is the lending and the green part is the borrowing. And we note that the slope okay, of this line is negative one plus R. And uh, we call this the marginal rate of transformation in the capital market. So one plus R, so negative one plus R, why is it negative? Well, of course, the budget constraint is downward sloping. And uh, negative one plus R again is what we refer to as the marginal rate of transformation in the capital market. So let's sort of analyze this a bit clearer so that uh, you all would get it uh, much better. So um, let, let's discuss further on the capital market trading line. So if you consider the budget constraint, which is this one, again, the rates are equal, the consumer's opportunity set provided by the capital market is the capital market trading line. Because you can now borrow and lend, that opens up that opportunity. 
And this is a set of consumption bundles, C0 and C1, that the consumer can attain given his or her endowment and the borrowing or lending rates, uh, or rate of interest in the capital market. Now, the trading line, as we have noted, uh, goes through the endowment point. So notice the line that we have goes through this point here, which is your endowment point. So it bisects that line, uh, the, bisects that point there. And at the endowment point, uh, the consumer neither borrows nor lends. So uh, the consumer will just spend and consume everything that he or she is endowed with in a particular period. So at the endowment point, no borrowing, no lending. Okay, now the slope of the budget constraint, which is essentially the derivative of future consumption uh, with respect to current consumption is equal to negative one plus R, which is uh, R being the rate of interest. And since this is negative, an increase in the current consumption decreases the amount of future consumption borrowing well, possible with borrowing or lending, right? Because you're only allocated with so much. And we refer to one plus R, so if we take the negative of it, because positive one plus R, as the terms of trade. So you see, you, you sort of hear that term in uh, international economics with world prices, but in the context of financial economics, that's also a terms of trade because that's a borrowing and a lending rate. Now, if C naught uh, is less than Y naught, that's the red part uh, that we illustrated earlier, the consumer can opt to lend, right? Because its current income, uh, it, it, it didn't spend exactly equal to the current income. It was able to spend lower than that. So each peso or each unit of currency he lends today can be transformed into extra C1 worth that amount times one plus R because he or she will earn interest income from the lending activity in the next period. Conversely, points to the right of the endowment point, that's the green points we illustrated earlier, are, uh, is a point where the consumer borrows against future income in the capital market at some interest rate R. So each peso of future income can be transformed into extra C0 worth uh, a discounted one over one plus R in today. Right? So that makes a lot of sense. Now, let's interpret the intercepts. So we said we had a W0 and a W1 earlier. What do they mean, right? So the maximum level of current consumption the consumer can afford, okay, uh, if he spends all of his endowment without leaving anything for future consumption is W0. Meaning if the person spends everything he could today and all that he could borrow today, and nothing spends nothing in the future, you're left with W0, right? So that's just basically if you set C1 equal to zero, you will, and you solve for C0, you get this one, which is Y0 plus Y1 over one plus R. And this intercept just happens to be the present value of the future, of the consumer's endowment. Conversely, uh, you could also have a case wherein the consumer can opt to not consume anything in the present. It can opt to lend everything that it has in the present and only consume in the future, right? So the, uh, the intercept W1 is the maximum level of future consumption that the consumer can afford if he or she does not consume in the present period and lends all of the endowment. So how do you do that? You just set C not equal to zero, no, no current consumption, and you solve for C1 and you get C1 plus one plus R times Y not. And that's essentially the future value of a consumer's endowment, right? So that intercept just happens to be that. Now, a linear intertemporal budget constraint, as you may have noticed, is rarely met in practice. However, it's nonetheless interesting for two specific reasons. The first is that it's a limiting case. Right? It shows what happens as the spread between borrowing and lending rates decrease or also increase in some cases. And also, it's a convenient simplification and acceptably accurate when the spread of the rates are small, right? So in this case, we have no spread at all because the borrowing and the lending rate are exactly the same. Now, let's have case B now, which is an intertemporal budget constraint with lending so a consumer can lend, but he or she cannot borrow, right? And this is, again, some present in some uh, markets today in that 
uh, there are certain banks uh, which usually regard as poor credit risks individuals who lack property that could be put up as collateral. So there are people in the world that do not have enough financial or enough physical assets that they can use as collateral to have a backup in case the, they default on a loan. Which in this case, the bank will of course allow them to lend because um, that's an explicit outlay, but they may not allow it to borrow for fear of uncertainty and for fear of risk. So they may not allow the consumer to borrow. So again, a possible case. However, you know, these individuals, while they cannot borrow, they can lend, right? Uh, the bank will of course not reject that. So these individuals may be able to save and lend some rate with the interest rate on lending equal to RS. Such consumers face the lifetime consumption bundle along the lending line. So we have this one, which is uh, note we're dealing with RS now because this is just a saving rate. There's no borrowing rate. And we're left with a very similar form, one plus RS times why not. Essentially, um, the future consumption with uh, in a case wherein there's lending but no borrowing is effectively equal to the um, this part which is one plus rs times why not plus the future endowment minus uh, one minus rs times c naught so essentially it's basically this one uh, it's interest income plus the future endowment we are rearranged we get that and again the uh, the restriction that we place is that this should be uh, the consumer can only uh, sort of lend. It cannot lend more than it can uh, than it was endowed with. So, uh, and it cannot consume more. I'm sorry, it cannot consume more than it was endowed with in order for it to be able to lend, right? So, C not must be less than or equal to why not. So, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it must be less than why not. So, take this out. And the budget constraint without lending and no borrowing would simply be the initial endowment. Um, that's C1. So again, the endowment point, if you, the consumer doesn't choose to borrow or lend, it would just simply be the endowment point. So uh, if we have a case wherein there is uh, lending but no borrowing, we have a budget constraint that is chisel shaped. So notice the lending part is here, but the borrowing part is gone because the consumer cannot borrow. So it's either they consume at the endowment point or they opt to lend. Right? So that's the only things at case B. So it's chisel shaped because we do not have a borrowing uh, line here. Now, the most uh, realistic case that we have is case C, wherein the person can borrow and lend, but the borrowing and the lending rate are different, right? And this is obvious, right? Because assume that the individual can borrow at RB and can lend at RS, it's more or less known that RB or the rate at which an individual can should borrow or that's used for borrowing is generally greater than the saving rate. And why is that the case? Well, it's kind of obvious. Well, banks have to cover administrative costs out of the spread between the savings interest rate and the interest on money and individuals borrow. And Again, individuals are more likely to fail to repay a bank than a bank is to fail to repay an individual. Uh, so uh, it's that sort of banks would ra rather hedge on, um, they know that they can probably pay uh, their loans, should they make out loans, but the consumer might default. So it charges a higher rate to sort of shield from that, uh, from that expected loss uh, other, uh, if the rates were equal in that case. So thus the risk premium is higher on loans to individuals than on bank deposits. So on bank deposits, uh, the banks can uh, accurately and positively manage it based on their strategy. But uh, on loans, they have, well, they do have a degree of control, but they'd like to hedge against the risk of individuals defaulting. So they charge a higher rate for that. Now, of course, uh, as we said earlier, the consumer can opt to lend. And lending happens when the current consumption is less than the future consumption. And uh, again, the loan will be repaid at a rate RS, right? And again, the consumer's present consumption must be less than the current uh, endowment, which is why not. So this is your intertemporal budget constraint when there is lending, when, you, when a consumer can opt to lend. And these lifetime consumption streams are to the left of the kink of the graph that we will show earlier. Now, if a consumer opts to borrow, 
then uh, th that's in the case where it, it chooses to consume more in the present than it was endowed with. So it borrows and it has to repay back what it borrowed with an interest rate, RB, in the next period. And we come up with this uh, budget constraint here. And this just reduces to this one here. And this domain just suggests that what the consumer should opt to borrow is something that he or she could repay. It's not an unreasonable borrowing. He or she could repay that amount in the future. And these are the affordable lifetime consumption streams which lie to the left of the cake. So if we bring all of these together, we can see here that um, we have a, uh, the capital market trading line, which now has a kink. Now you might wonder, okay, why does it have this sort of kink? Okay, so this point here is our initial endowment point. So this is the endowment point. So let's call that E. So sorry for my handwriting. I'm writing on a computer. So that's E. Now, if we have here, okay, so this part here is your lending part. So this is the what you call the lending part of your budget constraint. And the lending uh, part has a slope of negative one plus RS. But the borrowing part that we have, okay, the borrowing part that we have has a different slope, which is negative one plus RB. So this is borrowing. And this is the reason why the, uh, you might, it, it's different from case A. The line is not a straight uh, downward sloping line. It's because the rate of uh, the interest rate for borrowing and lending are different. In this case, notice that the slope of the borrowing line is, uh, is, is generally much steeper than the slope of the lending line. And that's just because um, this, uh, this uh, slope uh, has a higher interest rate, right? So uh, this is slightly more uh, steep than the lending rate, which is less steep because of the lower rate. Okay, so we have that. And that shows the capital trading line at KC. So notice, uh, again, um, if, we, uh, if we are at the green line here in this case, uh, that's the proportion of the consumer to lend. If you are at the blue line, that is uh, consumer borrowing. And again, that stems from C if we have a line here and this is C0, at this point, C0 is less than Y0 so you can lend. At this point here, if C0 were here, C0 is greater than Y0. So in here, you have to borrow to satisfy your present consumption. So that's pretty much it for this particular graph. Okay, so... Notice that in this graph, the individual's budget constraint looks like a boomerang, right? Because the rates are different. So the y-intercept one plus, uh, so the intercept that we have here, which is this one, one plus rs, y naught plus y1, is if the person um, opted to lend everything that they have. So chose to consume nothing in the present and just chose to consume in the future and lend everything. So this is the maximum second period consumption of C1 with lending and is obtained by setting C0 equal to zero in the equation of the lending segment of the opportunity set. The x-intercept is the exact opposite in which you set C0 equal to, try to set C0 equal to the maximum and you set C1 equal to zero, meaning you don't consume anything in the future. And this is the maximum first period consumption, C0. Now, notice that uh, the consumption opportunity set is kinked, as I said, because uh, at the initial endowment point, uh, which sets the domains for the borrowing, which is this one, and for the lending. So that bisects the two domains, which is the initial endowment point. And the reason that we, uh, the reason why they have, why it looks like a boomerang is because of the different rates. So thank you for paying attention in this relatively long video. And in the next video, we're going to tackle an actual example so we can see how these things work. Uh, in, uh, in, you know, in, when we do mathematical computation. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.